kind of wish he was still playing, don't you? <laughs> Darren, thank you very much. Thank you, Rick. Yeah. Good seeing you. Yeah. Uh, Rick, I appreciate that. That's a nice intro. <laughs> that, that was a great intro. And Rick, you forgot to say one thing. Darren Woodson loves the Lord. That's my number one. I mean, I, I got to look. I, I watched all that. I was sitting there backstage, and I was, I'm trying to peek out the curtain to see what the video. I haven't seen a video in years, so I'm looking at the video, going, "Man, that I am the furthest thing away from that now." I mean, my body feels great, <laughs> honestly. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you for having me today. Um, you know, it's, it's, an, it's an honor. I, I talked to Chad Hennings a couple of years ago, and he, he spoke here, and he told me, I mean, you're talking about salt of the earth. And, and him shaking hands and, and meeting you guys, uh, it was an honor to him. And when I talked to him, he said, listen, they're, they're great people, just through and through good people. But I want to start off with accepting change. And I know that's my topic today, but I want to tell you a story. And it starts here with the Dallas Cowboys back in the 80s. Who remembers Tom Landry? Yeah, yeah, you remember Co Coach Tom Landry? They call Coach Tom Landry the great innovator. He started what we call the 43 defense. And that was back in the 60s and 70s when he created the 43 defense as a coach. Today, every team, all 32 teams still run some form of that defense. I mean, that's how creative he is. You know you are a bad man when they, when they name a highway after you and they don't even put your name on it. They just put the hat on it. They put the fedora. You know, that's like Michael Jordan or Nike in the swoosh. Tom Landry was the epitome of greatness here in Dallas and throughout the National Football League. But Tom Landry at one point was the winningest coach in the NFL. Tom Landry put together 20 straight years, 20 straight winning seasons. Who does that? Belichick, maybe? But that's what we were talking about when we talked about Tom Landry. But in 1986, the Dallas Cowboys, led by Tom Landry, they go 7-9. 1987, it's a strike year. They go, they play 15 games, the team goes seven and eight. And then in 1988, Dallas Cowboys go three and 13. Three bad seasons. Cowboys get bought by the young upstart owner out of Arkansas named Jerry Jones. Did I just hear someone boo? <laughs> Did I just? I, Jerry Jones buys a team. The first thing he does is he fires the legend in Tom Landry. Playoff fires. People in Dallas are in an uproar. Cannot believe that this young guy out of Arkansas, who's not even a Texan, out of Arkansas, buys a team and fires the legend Tom Landry. And what does he do? He goes into the college ranks, not in the professional ranks to replace him. He goes to the college ranks and he picks up Jimmy Johnson, who is at the University of Miami. And if you guys know football, the one thing about the University of Miami, they were loud, brash, cocky, arrogant football team. And now you're replacing the most buttoned up coach, wore a suit on the sideline, wore his hat, most professional person you've ever met in Tom Landry with, Jimmy Johnson, who's just just wild and crazy guy. Dallas is, just, Dallas is upset about it. You guys remember, if you lived in Dallas, you, you remember that situation. It was, uh, it was ugly. So Jimmy comes in. Coach Landry's out. And on the first day, Jimmy has a meeting with the team. And this is in March. Coach Landry's out. All the players are in this meeting. There's 55 guys in this meeting room, just like this. And Jimmy gets up there. Jerry introduces him to the team. Jimmy walks up and he says, uh, I'm the new guy. Things are going to go my way. If you don't like it, hit the door. 
Now he's talking to guys like Ed Too Tall Jones, Randy White. And he's talking about Hall of Famers. Guys that have been with Coach Landry for years. He's talking to those guys. And Jimmy says, by the way, it's March. But in July, we're going to have a conditioning test. And in that conditioning test, you have to pass it. If you don't pass it, there's going to be problems. So it would behoove you to stay around this entire offseason and go through the off-season conditioning program. See, Tom Landry never had an off-season conditioning program. Tom Landry was the type of guy who would say, I want you guys to get away from football, go spend time with your family. They didn't have an off-season program under Coach Landry. It just didn't exist. Because he's a family man. Go spend time with him. When we come back in training camp, we'll get in shape in July, and then we'll go out and play the season. Jimmy was like, no, no, no. There is no off-season. It starts in March and leads up to July to training camp. So you better be in shape, lifting weights the whole nine. Tells the entire team that. Half the guys in that room say, yeah, right. Yeah, right. Coach Landry sent us home. I'm going home. So a lot of guys, I'd say 60% of the guys in that room leave. For the offseason, they go home, they go to Arkansas, they go out to Los Angeles, wherever their home base is, spend time with the families. And then you had about 30% of those who stayed around, did the conditioning, did the offseason program with Jimmy and the whole crew. So July 24th show comes up. Everybody reports to training camp. So what did Jimmy promise? What kind of test? Conditioning test. They all come back in town. July 24th, they're doing conditioning. Half the guys are falling out. Can't make it. One guy in particular falls down during the, during the conditioning test. He can't catch his breath. Jimmy walks over and tells him, asks him, what's wrong? The guy says, coach, I can't breathe. Chest is closing up. I can't breathe, coach. So Jimmy says, um, why don't you, I don't, I don't Maybe I shouldn't say it this way. He says, why don't you take, I, I can't say it the way Jimmy said it. He says, why don't you take your butt to the asthma field? And everyone's looking, where's the asthma field? The asthma field is a parking lot. Cut him on the spot. He was one of about 30 some guys, I, I, sorry, out of about 50-some guys, there were 30-some guys that were in and out that entire season. Jimmy began to cut people, left and right. He was trying to find his guys. The entire season, players, are, they didn't want to play for Jimmy Johnson. But Jimmy kept continuously bringing people in. I mean, I'm talking to the point where they would lose a game, and the players would be practicing on one field, and Jimmy would bring a guy in off the street that's, try, that's on the other side working out to take your job. It was cutthroat. Because what was he doing? He was trying to find his guys. He had drafted a young guy in, in Troy Aikman who was his guy. He had a guy from the previous regime named Michael Irvin, who he knew from the University of Miami, who, knew, who he knew was his guy. But he had maybe three guys on that team. Other than that, these were all Coach Landry's guys, and they had a commitment to Coach Landry. Jimmy was looking for his guys, so he's bringing them in, in and out, in and out, cutting people left and right. They go 1 and 15 for the season. Everyone's upset. Everyone's pissed off. Can't believe we brought this guy in. 1 and 15. The Cowboys. One in 15. So what ends up happening? They start to get better. Jimmy starts bringing his guys in. They start to buy into the system. 92 comes in. That's when they draft me. <laughs> now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that I was the guy that, that helped them get to the Super Bowl. I'm not saying that. <laughs> I'm not the reason for it. But in 1992, I come in, I get into this 
I come through the doors at the Dallas Cowboys in the locker room, and there's a whole bunch of alpha dogs. Jimmy finally got what he wanted. He was looking for alpha dogs. He asked my coach in college, who's Lovey Smith, who's now at the University of Illinois and was a big-time coach in the NFL. Lovey was my position coach at Arizona State. He asked Lovey Smith, what kind of guy is Darren Woodson? He said, well, he's got an alpha dog mentality. He'll fight you. He said, that's my guy. He drafted me. But I walk into the locker room, and I'm surrounded by the same mentalities. I'm su surrounded by guys like Emmett Smith, Charles Haley. You guys met Chad Hennings. Some of you guys met Chad Hennings a couple years ago. Guys who wanted to win, who were committed to winning. So we come in, 92, bam, we win the Super Bowl. 93, bam, we win the Super Bowl again. 93, we won the Super Bowl. After the Super Bowl, what happens? Jerry fires Jimmy. That's unheard of. I mean, that's, honestly, that's, that would be like Bill Belichick winning this year's Super Bowl and then Robert Kraft saying, you know what? I don't like success. <laughs> Us winning Super Bowls is not enough. You're fired. It doesn't happen that way. So what ended up happening? Pride got in the way. I got in the way of maybe, I'm sitting here, I got one ring on right now. I have two more rings at home. I should easily have five rings. Easily have five rings. But pride got in the way of the success of this organization. Jimmy built a great team. He drafted the guys. Jerry felt like, yeah, you drafted those guys, but I cut the checks. And I cut your check. They got in the way of each other. We ended up not winning it in 94. Got to the NFC Championship game, but I started to see the cracks in 94. We weren't the same team. Things are falling through the cracks. We didn't have the leadership there. 95, I have no idea. This is the ring for 95. I, to this day, I have no idea how we won the Super Bowl that year. Honestly. Barry Switzer comes in as the coach in 94. We go to the NFC Championship. 95, we find a way. We just, we found a way. And we try to lose it. Found a way to win it. And I, I tell people this all the time. The league just wasn't that good that year. I'm, I'm being honest. Us, in 95, we were a makeshift football team. Half of us didn't like each other. We had guys who came in who really didn't care about the game. 96, you really started to see it, started falling down. 97, started falling down. 98, started falling down, and it was, we were in the abyss for 5 and 11, three straight years, and then Parcells comes in. And I tell this story because this is the problem. When Jimmy came in, they didn't accept the change. Flat out didn't accept it. When he got his own people in, they bought into what he was trying to do. And when they bought in, they would run through that wall. I was one of them. I was brainwashed. Because the man knew how to lead men. He pushed the right buttons. We fought at practice. Yes, we competed. Like at the highest level, we competed. We used to have competition Tuesday. I'm sorry, competition Thursday. And you better believe it was like a game. Our, ga our practices were harder than our games, I promise you. Because guys are always fighting for the jobs. And that's how Jimmy wanted it. He wanted the competition. But it, it sharpened us week in and week out. Every Sunday we were sharp. And if you're going to beat us, you're gonna, it was going to be a four-quarter game. You better believe that. But then when we lost Jimmy, it started, everything went south. The leadership was gone. So what did Jimmy teach me? The one thing he taught me through the process of watching him from afar is that there are four levels of commitment. Seriously. And it, it applies not only in your business life but in your family life. There are four levels of commitment. Number one, if you got a notepad, I want you to write it down. Number one is existent. You've heard of that term before? When you're existent, when you're existing, that means that you're that person. Let's say you're working for, uh, for a company. You're an employee. When you're existing, you're that guy that walks in at, meeting starts at 8 o'clock, you walk in about 8.02, 8.03, cup of coffee in your hand. Yeah, if you're a young guy, you're probably doing Snapchat. 
Snap. Take pictures of yourself. Or you're at work and you're on Facebook. Nothing, you, you don't, nothing holds you dear to anything. You just, you're just there. It's a lifestyle deal. I, got, I took the job, it's a lifestyle deal. I like being here. Maybe they have a gym that I can work out during lunchtime and show up back to my desk an hour and a half late. You're just existing. I got to tell you to do everything. The boss has to tell you to do everything. Hey, clean your desk up. Hey, get that done. Do this, do that. When you're existing, you're just there. Happy to have a job. You guys know anybody like that? No? No one. Not one person in here. <laughs> but when you're existent, that's all it is. You just show up and you're just, that's a lifestyle deal. I mean, I can't stand people. I had a guy, and I'll give you an example. I won't mention his name, Dwayne Goodrich, but I'm not going to mention his name. <laughs> But I, had, I played with a guy in 1998, and this is a time when we were drafting guys who were just existing. They didn't care about the game. They had no passion about the game. They would just show up. And I say Dwayne's name because I know Dwayne, and to this day, Dwayne apologizes for what he was. Dwayne was content on the fact that he got drafted by the Dallas Cowboys in the second round. After that, it was over with. He had the status that he wanted. But he was existent. So we're playing a game. We're playing the Los Angeles Rams. I'm sorry, St. Louis Rams. We're in St. Louis. And Dwayne Goodrich was our fifth corner in the rotation. And he, he was dressed out that day because we had some injuries at the position. Well, our number one corner goes down. And I'm standing there on the sideline. Our corner is down on the field. And Dwayne Goodrich is the next guy in line. He's the next guy up. And this is when I talk about existing. I'm looking at the guy, the cornerback that's on the ground who's hurt. We need to bring on our, our next one, Dwayne Goodrich. And I see Goodrich, I look him right in the eyes, and he does not want to get on the field. Does not want to become a professional athlete. He's existing. Couldn't find his helmet. And we had three minutes to go in the game. So I look at my defensive coordinator, Mike Zimmer, and Zimmer's yelling at him, yelling at him, go get this, go do this, blah, 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 blah. And he's like in his own world. And I told Zimmer, I said, you know what? I got it. I'm playing the corner. He's out. I can't do it. I can't play with him. Can't play with him. He is existed. That's what he, he didn't think of anything else, but it was a lifestyle. I'm a Dallas Cowboy. This is all I need to do. Didn't want to work. Didn't want to do anything. And then there's those people that are compliant. Compliant. Write that one down. Because we know a lot of people that are compliant. Hell, I was compliant when I first started ESPN. I was just compliant. I'm just being real. Compliant. You'll show up on time, 8 o'clock meeting, show up about 7.58. Boss has to tell you what to do all the time. You're not going to do anything on your own. The boss has to say, he has to prod you to do some things. Hey, uh, make sure this project gets done. Okay, and you turn it in. He says, get it done in three days. You get it done in three days. You're not going to volunteer to do anything. There is no volunteering to do anything that's going to help the company. Nothing. You're compliant. I'm going to show up. When they tell me to show up, I'm going to act like they want me to act. I'm going to dress like the, the way they want me to dress, but I'm not going to do anything else. I'm not going to make this business any better. I'm just going to be compliant. I have a son, 16-year-old boy, who is compliant at school. <laughs> compliant. I tell him all the time, dude, you just show up. I start talking to him, dude. Yeah, I'm sure some of your, the dads say the same thing to their kids, so I, they can relate. You just show up and just do the minimum. And he said, yep. <laughs> Basically, he becomes a C student. So when you're compliant, you're, that's what you are. You are a C student. You're gonna do just enough to get it done. Well, see, I don't play compliance in my house. I mean, you can't be compliant in my house. And he feels my wrath all the time. <laughs> I promise you. 
he was compliant last year, and of the nine months of school, he was probably grounded about six last year <laughs> until he got it right. But I'm not going to change. Compliant is flat out mediocrity. It's flat out mediocrity. You could care less. And that applies to us as well here. Because I judge my son for getting C's and being compliant. If he wanted to, he could judge me as well for just being compliant at work, just giving half the effort. If he really knew what I did on a daily basis, there's times where I, hey, he could probably judge me the same way. And it's the same thing. Your kids could probably judge you the same way. So why don't you think about that? Think about that in your heart. Am I just compliant? Am I existent or am I compliant? Where am I right now? And then there's committed. Write it down. It's number three. Committed. All right, when you're committed, and I like committed, because you sort of, you know where committed is. You know where that person, when he's committed, you're like, okay, I, I know you. I know you're going to show up on time. You're probably going to do some things that are going to surprise me for the good, for the company, for good of the team. When you're committed, that means, that's like a, good, like a marriage. When you're committed in your marriage, hey, that's good. That's, I'm serious. That's solid. You are as solid a person as you can be when you're committed in anything you do. But you're going to show up on time. You're going to make sure the boss knows that, hey, I'm all the way in, guys. I'm here. But then when you leave, when that committed person leaves the business and goes home, he thinks about home. Don't think about the business. Don't think about the teammates. It's, I'm committed. I walk out the door, I'm home. You guys know anybody like that? You guys know people like that, committed? Raise your hands. And I'm telling you, committed is not bad. If, you, if that's your expectation, if you're a manager or a boss, if you like committed people and that's your expectation of them, it's okay. They're committed, they're good. And some of them are solid workers. But let me tell you the one I like. And I want you guys to write this one down. That person that's compelled you see, one thing about the person that's compelled, the meeting starts at 8 o'clock, he's there or she's there at 7.30. Volunteering, putting up desks, putting up chairs, doing extra work. When the boss says, hey, this needs to get done in, two day, in three days, she's done in one and a half days, two days. There's a guy I played with, his name was Michael Irvin, and he had a ton of warts off the field, tons of them. But I don't know if I knew another person outside, I mean, hey, I thought I was compelled. I didn't, I, all I did was live, breathe football all my life. I've been playing since I was seven years old. That's all I knew. I wasn't a doctor, I wasn't a, you know, I wasn't gonna be an attorney, I was a football player, I knew that. So I always thought, no one loves this game more than me until I met Michael Irvin. You talk about compelled. Michael Irvin would show up at 6 a.m., would not leave until 8 o'clock. If that. I used to ask Mike, I said, do you even have a house? Because <laughs> that's all he knew. That person that's compelled, you, you don't have to worry about him. You know when game time shows up, when it's game time and they introduce you, that one guy, you look to your right and you know that guy that's compelled, you're like, yeah, we're going to war today. Here we go. He's got my back. And the same goes for those who are managers and bosses. When you have that, that, that employee that is compelled, you know you don't have to worry about. You know you don't. I have an older boy. His name is DJ. And DJ used to play basketball when, when he was a kid. Well, DJ was not really com compelled to play basketball. He played because his buddies played. But DJ figured out what he was passionate about, and it's music. It actually was not singing, it's sound audio engineering. It's these big old sound boards, like way up there, like we, you see up there. That's, that's what he did. That's what he was. 
So from the age of 10 to now he's 23 years old, he's put in hours after hour after hour. He graduated from school, he went out to California. And right now, our conversations are about taxes. And that's a good conversation to have with a 23-year-old boy living in California. He works all day long. He's compelled to get it right. He's compelled, he's passionate about it. And that's what we need more, more of. Listen, if you're not all the way committed and compelled to do whatever it is, go look for something else. Because that, that person that's existent, if you're hiring people that are existent or if you're working with people that who are just existent or compliant, they're always looking for something else. You can walk by their desk and they're probably searching for another job. Seriously. I play with guys like that. I used, I used to always hear guys tell me that were existent and compliant. Man, I tell you what, uh, San Francisco 49ers don't practice this hard. And you guys say, we're no different. The NFL players are no different than what we see in this room. I promise you, the, the conversations, guys making $8 million and is existent. Like, uh, I can't stop smoking a joint. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's like idiotic stuff. Like, you would think, okay, you do, you're about to make $8 million and you're smoking a dollar joint. <laughs> So if you get suspended, that means you don't make the $8 million. I just dealt with that this past, in three weeks ago, I just dealt with that. I just talked to a guy off the ledge three weeks ago who just got suspended. And, you, and we laugh about it, but he is as talented as they come, but he's existent or slash compliant. And he can't get over a dollar joint and lost $8 million. That's a shame. So what am I looking for? What are you looking for in your own business? Who are you? I'm not even talking about who you're looking for. Who are you? Look at yourself, look within yourself and find out, who are you? Am I committed to, to doing the job that I'm doing or am I compelled? And if I'm compelled, everyone around me Everyone around me, my house is that way. My wife is compelled, she's a, uh, a design architect. Every day of her life is, how do I get better? How do I get better? How do I get better? How do I make her better? And I love it. I mean, I just, I absolutely love it. I love the competition, the competitiveness she has because she knows who I am as the same way. We're like sharks. We want to get better. We want to sharpen each other. And that's what I'm asking you guys today. Who are you? Which one of the four are you? Existent? Committed? You're compliant, that's one low, that's below that, below committed, or are you compelled? I talked earlier when I walked up, first thing I said, and I hope you guys don't mind this, but I'm a man of God, every morning. Doesn't matter what I'm doing, my feet hit the ground, I'm on my knees. My mom taught me at a, that at a young age. If I knew one person that's compelled is my mother and her faith. But she taught me that at a young age. Get on my knees, thank God, every day. And I'm compelled to do that every single day and, at every, and every night. And I'm compelled to teach my kids the same thing. So my kids, every, every morning, hit that closet, get on those knees. Every night, brush your teeth, you better brush your teeth. <laughs> Got to brush your teeth. <laughs> Get on those knees and thank them. But that's what I wanted to pass on to you today. Uh, I definitely wanted to open it up for questions. I know we have some time. Do I have time for questions? Where is that? Where's the boss, Angelica? <laughs> I got 15 minutes. I'm going to ask some questions. I mean, if you guys want to ask some questions of me, what I'm doing now is I, I, I'm still an analyst with the, with the ESPN. I cover all 32 teams. I saw a Patriots fan in here earlier. Where, where are you? Yeah. Anywho. I gave him a deflated ball earlier. But I wanted to make... <laughs> 
I wanted to open it up because I have to cover all 32 teams. I wanted to open it up for you guys. If you guys have any questions for me, please don't hesitate to ask. And they got mics floating around right here. I'm all about inspiring people. Thank you for inspiring us this morning. Well, thank you. How do you get your people from one to four? How do I get them from one to four? Uh, sometimes that's great. You know what? Can I throw you a ball? That's. I'm, I'm going to put. You have to catch it. And you better lay out for it if I throw it. No, you don't. Someone else can catch it. <laughs> Someone else can catch it. Yeah, Mia, why don't you come up? That's a great question. <laughs> Yeah, I have a hand out with all. <laughs> hey, right there, there. Yeah, there we go. I should lay it out for that one. How do I, how do I get them from one to four? I, this is, I think you have to know the person you're dealing with. I dealt with it as, as a captain of the Cowboys. I came in in 92 and 93, they nominated me the captain after my first year. So 93 through... 2004, I was a, the Dallas Cowboys defensive captain, and I used to always have to motivate certain guys. I talked about Dwayne Goodrich. Every day I was trying to motivate him, every day. The one thing you have to do is you have to get to know what buttons to push. What's the button? Where's the button that, that drives you? And sometimes you'll just find out flat out. Not the one. Fire. Sir, you hear me? He's not the one. Sometimes you got to cut your losses. Simple as that. But if you really want to work, you have to put the time in. And I feel like when I was a captain, I had to put extra time in with guys. Because a lot of them were, they weren't all the way, they were existent because they had family issues going on. They were existent because they didn't understand. They didn't have the knowledge and the understanding of how this team or how the defense is being played or the information that was, provided, that was given to them. They just couldn't digest it. And because they couldn't digest it and they didn't have the knowledge, they shut down. You got to keep them on your hip. You have to keep them on your hip. If you want someone to go from existent to compelled, you have to keep them on your hip and guide them. Be a leader. Get to know them. Get to know them outside the workplace. Invite them over to the house. That's how you get them from one to four. And trust me, I've done that. I've had to do that in times. I was with ESPN, and I said it earlier, I was just compliant when I first started. I had a guy named Mark Schlereth who saw that I was just showing up and grabbed me and said, this is what you have to do to get better. This is what you have to do to be compelled in this industry. This is what you have to do to make the next step. If not, they are going to fire you. <laughs> and I just took his lead. I honestly did, because my pride got in, my pride got in a way to say, right, look, I, need to get, I don't want to get fired. I want to get better. It meant something. It really did. It meant something to me to get better, and that's what I did. Uh, let me get another question. There, no, right here. Right here. Is Jerry Jones compelled to win another Super Bowl? <laughs> uh, I, for the longest, that's a great question. For the longest time, I would say Jerry was compelled to make as much money as he possibly could. And I'm just being honest. Jerry is a businessman. And you know, there's, there was, there's been a time for the longest time, even though the Cowboys weren't winning, they were still the number one team as far as merchandise. And he was happy and compelled to be the number one. He'd always talk about it. Yeah, we're the number one in sales. We make more money than anyone. That's Jerry's goal. That was, that's been his Jerry goal, uh, Jerry's goal until he hired a guy named Will McClay. Will McClay is now, he doesn't have the, the title of GM, but Will McClay is the acting GM for the Dallas Cowboys. He made a great hire and he stepped back. And now we're starting to see Jerry become more compelled as far as winning because he's hiring the right people and he's taking his hands off of it. Will McClay has been the guy who's drafted Dak Prescott, Ezekiel Elliott, 
uh, Martin, the list goes, Tyron Smith, the list goes on and on. He's making great decisions because he's a football guy. And I think that's when, that, with that question, I think Jerry's finally figured out, yeah, he's still compelled to make money, but he's compelled to take his hands off enough and allow this team to draft the right way. And they're going to get there. Trust me, this team is going to get there. I'm not sure if it's going to be this year, but they're about a year away from, uh, from getting there. Yeah, right. Absolutely. 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 The question was, in life, don't you have to be committed before you become compelled? Exactly. Yeah, because you go existent, you become compliant, you become committed, and then you become compelled. And commitment, the commitment is what gets you there. Seriously. When you finally commit yourself to saying, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to wake up every morning and I'm going to watch film of every, like this is what I'm talking about myself. Because when I was just compliant with the ESPN, I wasn't watching all the film that I needed to watch, nor was I doing all my research. So what I said, I said to myself, well, my guy showed me how to get committed. And when I committed myself, the passion got there. And once the passion got there, that's when I was compelled. And that's when you don't have to, I didn't have to remind myself. I knew at 6 o'clock in the morning, the alarm didn't have to wake me up. How many of us have that? We have our own set alarm. That alarm wakes you, and it's usually like those, those CEOs types, those alpha types, those uh, type A types. It's usually us, but the alarm does not have to wake us up. I'm up. Go ahead. Oh, the Texas ownership? <laughs> you know, uh, I, I don't know enough about their ownership. I know the players. The players on that defensive side of the ball, J.J. Watt and those guys, they're compelled. They want a championship. What's holding the Texans, this is honest, the God, truth, what's holding the Texans back is the quarterback position. And that's just a talent issue. I don't know if you can do, I don't care if you're existent, committed, you know, compelled, but compliant, you, you have a talent issue, you, you're not going to win. And I think that's where the Texans lie right now. They fix the quarterback situation, they'll be okay. Right here. Okay, we all have bad days, and your story is very compelling, but what do you do when you have a bad day and you're, you need that? Personally, what do you do to get recharged? Recharge? That's, man, hey, you need a ball. That's a good one. Can I throw, I don't know if I can with the suit on. <laughs> Oh, it's close. That's, a, that's coming from a safety. <laughs> um, what do I have to do to get recharged? Right? I used to have a guy, Bill Parcells. You guys remember Bill Parcells? In my mind, probably the best coach I've ever been around. Bill Parcells used to have, play these mental games with us. And he used to say, he used to, say to us, don't let, don't let your brain control you. You, he's, I don't know if I can say, he said, you kick your brain's ass. Don't let your brain kick your ass. Because in the end, we're all cowards. When you really think about it, when you look down at the core of who we are, we're cowards. We want the easy way. We always want the easy way. Am I right? We want it the easiest way. If we possibly can get it that way, we just, okay, if, if it's that easy to get it done, let's we're sprinting to do it. But nothing comes easy. Success does not come easy. He used to always tell us, you kick your brain's ass. You tell your brain what we're going to do. And sometimes it's getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning when you don't want to get up. Doing the things that you really don't want to do. But you always got to have that dream. Here's my outcome. This is where I need to get. This is what I'm doing with my son right now. I have a 16-year-old boy. He's committed to the University of Texas. He thought because he's been... <laughs> How did I know that was going to happen? But he's here. He sees the ultimate goal is to go to UT, but he stopped. He stopped getting up early. Now that he got his commitment, there was a point here where he stopped getting up early. He stopped doing the little things, and I had to show him all over again. Here's the University of Texas. You have a verbal commit. You have not signed. You're 16 years old. You're only a sophomore. They can easily say, uh, you suck now. <laughs> you're gone 
So what do I have to do? I have to show him, look, this is your goal, son. It can easily disappear if you don't get up in the morning, go hit balls, do your groundwork, do, go work out as far as your lifts and all that. I have to keep continuously, as a parent, I have to continuously show him what to do. And I don't, you know what, I think one of the biggest things, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to elaborate on this, because how many parents do we have in here? All right, well, most of us, right? All right, listen, don't ever stop. I don't care if your kids do not like you. <laughs> don't stop. Here's my example. I have a 22-year-old boy, 23-year-old boy, lives in L.A. A year ago, he sat me down and said, Dad, thanks for being hard on me. Came back around. Now, we went through some tumultuous times where I was thumb, thumb, on him, on him, on him. And we would get into it. And he would shut down and get upset with me, and he can't, they come back around. They do. As long as they show, you show them that you're committed and you are all the way in on them, and you love them unconditionally, they'll come back around. And I'm the same way right now. I'm going through it, just like anyone else. I'm going through it with my 16-year-old right now. Whether it be school, whether it be life, whether it be drugs, whether it be girls, my job, as a parent, is to show him the right direction. Am I right? You lean on them. You lean on them, because they're gonna come back around. Because I know one day, and I, tell, I just told him this the other day, I said, one day, you're gonna be playing for the Milwaukee Brewers. And he was like, Milwaukee Brewers? Why not the Yankees or the Rangers? I said, I don't care, son. Milwaukee Brewers. And you're gonna get on TV after you hit a home run, and you're gonna say, Dad, actually, we know what he's going to say. He's going to hit a home run. He's going to look at the TV and he's say, Mom? <laughs> That's what he's going to say. But I know I'm, I'm going to do my job. Let me get a, another one. Right here. Blue shirt. I'll get you right after. First of all, I'd like to commend you on family. Um, I have two kids. One is uh, 30. The other one's 26. I'm not giving up. And they're, they're good kids. Yeah. Um, tell us about your life after football and business ventures. That you my life after football? Please. All right. My life after football. So I, all my life, I've been playing football since I was seven years old. Like 36 years old, I retired, a Dallas Cowboy. My life started all over again. Had no idea that my life was going to start all over again. But that's what we do. I mean, the, the, life, the average lifespan for a, for a football player is three years. So most of the time, the guy's been playing since he was seven years old. He gets into the NFL at about 21 years old. He plays three years, 24, 25. He gets cut. And now he's out into the real world. That didn't happen to me until I was 36. I had a back injury, thought I was gonna play an extra couple years, nerve damage. You don't quit the NFL. The NFL quits you, or your body quits you. That's how it usually works. You don't walk, just walk away. So, had the injury at 36 years old, my life started all over again. Had no background in anything. I wasn't, uh, I was a football player. I didn't know anything about real estate. Uh, I did some finance work when I was playing. Thank God to my, my agent who helped me, who schooled me on some things. But I had no idea where I was going. No direction. The one thing that helped me is that I, I've always surrounded my, with myself with people who are real with me. I mean, flat out real. I have my agent, who is like one of my best friends, uh, would cuss me out sometimes. My best friends, they, they, I didn't care if I played football or not. If I got, if I got an interception return and scored a touchdown, they would say, You're, you know, you were so slow to get there. <laughs> I mean, and I think that's what really helped me is that I was a, I, I've always been surrounded by people who just kept it real with me. So I got into, uh, at 36 years old, I sat around for a little bit, I did some investments, I got my butt kicked in a few investments, small investments. But then I started to understand and I started to get involved with software. And it went through a three year learning process and right now I own a company, it's called CounterFind and we eliminate uh, counterfeit merchandise on social media platforms. That's what we do. But it took me three years, actually four years, 
of figuring it out. And I think that's the hardest thing for athletes, whether it be the NFL, NBA, or whatever. We've been coddled for so long. High school, people always surround us and make sure that no one gets to us. College, they make sure no one gets around us because they just want us to play football or play sports. And then we go to the, the, we go to the, the pro leagues and they coddle us the same way. They want us to just play that sport and then they spit us out. And you see guys go dead broke. Dead broke. And it's a shame. It's an absolute shame. Because we haven't been surrounded by people who told us the truth. How to hold on to your money. Do the little things. We're just out there now. But that's what I had. I had to cut my teeth. Um, and humble myself. I've, I've been hum My entire life I've been humbled so many times. I Man, it's okay. It's okay. That's growth. So I just figured it out where I wanted to be, found my little niche, and now I'm doing ESPN and I have my own business. And I'm still getting my butt kicked every once in a while. Hey, Woody. Good to see you again. Hey, one, one thing you left out, too, that I'm surprised is being passionate. Mm -hmm. Because when it came to football or it came to working out after football, because I saw you personally do that because we did it a few times together. Yeah. And you were passionate. That's for sure. Um, the one thing, too, uh, I don't know how much you can address it in a public forum, but what's going on up in Bristol? I mean, Mike and Mike's breaking up. Yeah. They're letting people go left and right. I mean, it uh, sounds like there's a lot of stuff going on up there. So uh, whatever you can tell us, let us know, because uh, I'd love to hear it. Um, ESPN right now. ESPN is going through the, the Jerry Jones, Tom Landry phase right now. I mean, and it's hard. It's hard to watch it go take place. A lot of changes going on, but what's happening now, people are going to have to start accepting those changes. I've seen a lot of my friends. Hey, I thought I was going to be on the cut, on the cut board. I mean, I was, my name was up there. It's like along with anybody else. And it's a humbling experience to know when they put your name on there. So what the deal is, I don't know if you guys know, ESPN is purging itself right now. And has been for the last six months. They're letting some of the analysts go, uh, some of the producers go. They're letting a lot of people, they're firing or letting a lot of people go in, in the process, but a lot of big names, a lot of big names. And they put our names on this list. I saw the name, my name on this list of about 100 people, which is a humbling experience. But somehow, some way, I made the cut. It's, it's a tough deal, man, right now up there. But they have to get lean. And, and they, they finally, I think they finally got to where they want to be. But I've seen guys like the guy, my mentor, Mark Schlereth, gone. Uh, Ron Jaworski, gone. Uh, Merrill Hodge with the big ugly ties, gone. I mean, <laughs> it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's part of change. And people are going to have to accept it up there right now. Thank you, Darren. All right, we're good. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. That was awesome. Very good. Very good. Thank you, Darren. We hot. Oh yeah. Thank you, Darren, for spending the morning with us. Let's give it one more round of applause.